r slash ima we are nasa scientists and exoplanet experts ask us anything about today's announcement of seven earth-sized planets orbiting trappist one how long would it take with current technology to get to this solar system assuming it's a good few hundred years what is the next step in finding out what's going on there if we reach the same 165 000 miles per hour that one pro breached by slingshotting by jupiter i think it'll take about 160 000 years or so edit if we use voyager one solar system escape velocity of 38 000 provided by slash u slash and it's more like 700 000 years that's about 23 000 human generations it's also a bit longer than how old the first signs of Neanderthals are. Ah. A modest 160. 000, 000 years. Duck. Edit. My most upvoted comment. Thanks Reddit. Edit 2. Thank you kind stranger for the gold. Hello. And congratulations and thank you for this discovery. You people are doing amazing work. I have two questions for you. 1. Do we know what kind of a gravity compared to Earth or Mars appears on those three planets that could have water in them? 2. Can we expect to have the technology in the next 20, 30 years that we could foresee for sure that there would be life in those planets in form of vegetation? To answer your second question. In order to see vegetation and any other surface features, for instance, oceans, continents, We'll need future telescopes beyond JWST that will be able to directly image exoplanets. JWST will observe planets transiting their host stars. Transits are when the planet passes between us and its star. And from these transits, we can observe how gases in the planet's atmosphere interact with starlight passing through the atmosphere. Unfortunately, this technique doesn't allow us to see the surfaces of exoplanets. To do that, We'll need farther future technology that may become available in the coming decades that will allow us to block out the star's light and observe the planets directly. Examples of these technologies are starlight suppression tools called coronagraphs and starshades. The planets we observe directly with these starlight suppression techniques will not be spatially resolved. They will literally be single points of light. But don't despair, because we can still learn a lot from single points of light. By analyzing the spectrum of colors in these points of light, we can search for signs of interesting gases, like water vapor and gases produced by life called biosignatures. And we can look for temporal changes in the light caused by processes like planetary rotation and seasonal variations. However, the Trappist-1 planets, being so close to their host star, would likely be tricky to directly observe in this way. These starlight suppression technologies fail once you get too close to the star. And so these types of observations would be extremely difficult. Other planetary systems orbiting hotter stars may be detectable with these technologies. Though. And on them. We'd be able to search for things like vegetation and other interesting signs of habitability and life. GA. Starshades. This is what I'm calling sunglasses from now on. If life is discovered on any of these exoplanets, how long would it probably take from time of discovery to an actual announcement to the public? Would that time differ depending on the types of life found? Would it take longer to disclose sentient beings than it would to disclose microbial life? Would the relatively close nature of the planets have any sort of dramatic effect on surface tidal forces, or would this somehow be offset by the star? My thoughts being, that our moon has a pretty noticeable effect on Earth. And if those planets are that close to each other I would have thought all sorts of weird weather nonsense would happen. Not only that, but possibly even magnetic, geological slash volcanic, and other unforeseen effects too. What are the most promising ways, to search a planet that far away for life? Assuming it is not intelligent enough to broadcast signals outward? We will look at the atmosphere for gases that do not belong gases that might be attributed to life. We will not know if the gases are produced by microbial life or by intelligent alien species. SS. You're searching for alien farts? Does Trappist-1 itself pose any hazards to the planets, like radiation or flares? Trappist-1 shows one flare eruption every week and a strong one every six months. 
its sex ray activity is not yet very well known, and could be also a threat for any life there. But if the planets have an atmosphere and magnetic field this could limit the level of high energy flux. This is still work under investigation to estimate those levels. Could also be a threat for any life there. Threat? What would be the temperatures on each of these planets and the most likely chemical compositions? Are they likely to have a magnetic field? Surface temperatures depend on the proximity to the central star, but also on the composition and thickness of the planet's atmosphere. Since we do not yet know anything about the planetary atmospheres, all we can say is how much energy a planet is receiving from the star compared to how much energy Earth receives from the sun. However, because this planetary system is so nearby, scientists should be able to characterize the atmospheres with future instruments and observatories. That's one reason why we are so excited about this discovery. Natalie Batalha. Any chance we could name these planets after the seven dwarves? That would be a lovely idea, with the Trappist team. We were more considering using names of the few Trappist ears. JDW. This comment right here is definitive verification that this account comes from real astrophysicists. Hey guys. Love this discovery. I got chills when I saw the headline. My question is regarding the orbits of these planets. How exactly do you all think the planet's gravity is affecting the other planets? If the innermost planets are tidally locked, would they get slightly disrupted by passing other planets? Are their orbits not entirely elliptic? Could they be slightly wavy due to other planets' gravitational pulls? Thanks for doing this Amma. I hope my question doesn't get lost in the masses. So glad we can finally share the chills. The planet's gravity is affecting each other, in leading to what we call transit timing variations, TTVs, which is at the basis of how we can estimate the masses of the Trappist-1 planets. When planets are close together, and their orbits are in a certain spacing, they interact with each other through gravity, causing the timing of their transits to change a little as the planets tug on each other. By measuring this change, we can determine the mass of the planets. By knowing precisely the size and mass of the planets, we can determine their bulk density. And geophysicists can then help us better understand their interiors. Then next to this, there will most likely be some tidal heating and significant tides on the planets. That would be water worlds. The constraints on the orbital eccentricity of the planets are a work in progress and the amplitude of the effects described above will depend strongly on those. So let's see. It is really just the beginning for the exploration of this system. Spitzer helped us lift the fail on its architecture. Now we can initiate its characterization the venture for the generation to come. JDW. I can't believe I understood everything you just said. I'm so jealous this is your job. All the best in your future endeavors. What information will you guys receive from these planets if the James Webb telescope is ready and functional? NASA's upcoming James Webb Telescope, launching in 2018, will take over with a much higher sensitivity. It will be able to detect the chemical fingerprints of water, methane, oxygen, ozone, and other components of a planet's atmosphere. Ferris Morales. Is it likely that any of the Trappist planets have magnetic field? Can tidally locked planets have magnetic field? How is the habitable zone estimated for tidally locked planets? How does knowledge of this system affect theories of planetary formation? The habitable zone is estimated based on the luminosity of the star and recognizing how far away can you be from it such that water can exist in its liquid form on the surface of a terrestrial planet like the Earth. Too close and the water evaporates, too far and the water freezes solid. Thus, the habitable zone is independent of whether the planets are tidally locked or not. Ferris Morales. It would be great to have measurement slash comparison of just how Goldilocks a planet might be. So, for example, Earth might be 90% Goldilocks. Mars might be 20% because it's closer to the edge of the zone, etc. What are the primary impacts of being an Earth-sized world so close to a smaller, dimmer star? from the perspective of a human on the surface of such a world. I mean. I read that all are tidally locked to the star does that mean they'd only have habitability bangs around the perimeter slash twilight region. Tidal locking, we think as long as there is an atmosphere, even if an atmosphere like that on Mars, 
it will circulate around the planet. So habitability location should extend beyond the limbs. Interesting. There would probably be some pretty massive winds going from a hot sun face to the cold dark face. I imagine it would be better to be in the penumbra anyways, to have some solid ground between you and any big CNEs. Do we know the age of the system and planets? Not precisely because such little stars evolve very 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 slowly. They live for hundreds of billions years compared to 10 billions for our own sun, we can say that it is older than 500 million years. But it could be several billions years and even older than our own system. 4. 7 Gia. They live for hundreds of billions years. Keeping in mind that the universe is only 12, 14 billion years old. And this star is not likely first generation. Hi. And congrats on the amazing discovery. Although I'm aware we can't see the Trappist-1 star. Where in the night sky would it be if we could see it? The system of planets is relatively close to us. In the constellation Aquarius. Seems like that might answer your question. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Aquarius. How long have NASA known about the discovery? What is really important about these types of discoveries is that they are checked by other scientists and confirmed external to the original team this is called the peer review process and has to occur before any scientific work is made public. To make sure we are giving the best information available HW. So. A while. Then. How can a young aspiring astronomer like myself get involved in this kind of work? At my university it seems like undergrads get funneled directly into academia. What does it take to work at an institution like NASA? I've already started getting involved in research as a sophomore. And my dream research topic is exoplanets. There are many possibilities. You can log into the NASA Planet Quest site and see tools and databases about the planets as they are discovered. Try logging into eyes on exoplanets. JPL. Got it. And other NASA centers have summer internships and lots going on in the world of exoplanets. This would be a good way for you to get some first and experience. Most NASA scientists like myself have PhDs, but have chosen to work for NASA rather than in universities. You could start in a PhD program, possibly doing your research in direct conjunction with NASA. Or working for a professor like Sarah Seager who does lots of NASA funded work on exoplanets. Following that, try for a postdoctoral position at a NASA center. Many good postdocs go on to become regular NASA employees. I appreciate your interest. Michael Werner. This is one of my biggest regrets. I wish I had gone to school for physics or astronomy, but there were no jobs in the Northeast. Now being married with kids and a degree in biology, I'm stuck. I think about it every day as I go about my dreary job as a pharmaceutical chemist. For the 9, 12 year olds in my class. What space futures might these kids look forward to? What will we need from their generation of kids to make these space dreams possible in the future? For the future of exoplanet research. Would it be more fruitful in your opinion to continue looking at different batches of stars for more planets? Or would you rather we focus more closely on the planets that have already been found? So if we were to imagine Earth as the planet closest to this star, how many of the other six planets would we have visited with satellites, rovers, manned orbits, manned landing, etc. I'm trying to imagine how close they all are together in a way that is fun. All of them. They are very, very close together all are much closer to one another and to their host star than the Mars Earth distance. For example, Michael Werner, is it correct to say that if they are 40 light years away, they are now receiving our radio broadcasts from 1977? Ducking like and subscribe.